Welcome everyone. Today finds me in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And more precisely, I'm at the Mount Olivet Cemetery. Now this is a truly historic resting place. On December 6, 1917, there was a tremendous explosion in the Halifax Harbor. There were two ships, one was carrying munitions, and they collided, and the explosion was the biggest man-made explosion up until Hiroshima. Over 1,900 people died, and many of them were buried right here. Also, many victims of the Titanic are buried here. This was one of the closest ports of call to the site of the Titanic going down. So I don't have a map or anything, but we're going to wander around. And if we find anything from about April, what was that, uh, April 14th, thereabouts, 1912, that should tell us something's probably Titanic related, or early December of 1917 is probably related to the Halifax explosion. So let's take a look. And the elements have taken their toll. Here's a marker from 1899 that's completely tipped over and broken. Here's another that can barely be read any longer, completely weathered away. And I see a small marker here with three letters, E-M-B, and nothing more. And it looks like it was just laid down here. And unfortunately, here are some others in disrepair. And all of these markers designate Catholic nuns. They all show the name and the date of a sister. Halifax has a wonderful maritime museum, and there you can see remnants of the Titanic. A lot of it were wooden pieces that were found floating around, and deck furniture, and that sort of thing. And they're all on display. And you can see that in a video from about two years ago. I'll try to link it down below. And this reads in loving memory of P. Vincent Coleman, killed in Halifax disaster, December 6, 1917, age 45 years. According to the plaque, it says Coleman was on duty. He noticed the ship burning and he alerted a lot of people. He died a hero. He actually warned trains not to enter the city, probably saved many lives. Turns out this is like finding a needle in a haystack. There doesn't seem to be an old or new part of the cemetery and without any type of designation to know a specific name. Kind of hit and miss. I'll bet this is a clue. Let's head over and take a look. And here are grave markers all bearing the date April 15th, 1912. I'm Dee Ryan Meister and I'm president of Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada. We're here in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Mount Olivet Cemetery where 19 victims of the Titanic tragedy are buried. Mm -hmm. I'm standing in the Titanic um, grave site so I can uh, point out some of the grave markers. We have Mr. Uh, Lepropolis here and uh, it's harder to see the names on the grave markers in this cemetery. Okay. Now are these all original headstones from the day or were they put in later? These are all original headstones. There are 19 here, there are 121 in the uh, Fairview Lawn Cemetery, and there are 10 in the Barrender Hirsch Cemetery, which is adjacent to the Fairview Lawn Cemetery. Mr. Aré Jalet was the um, head pastry chef on Titanic. Really? And his granddaughter provided the photographs that you see here at his grave marker. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. This is, I guess you can see, Servando Oviz. His actual name is much longer than that. He was a first class passenger, the only first class passenger buried in the cemetery. Now, how were we able to identify these folks and how were they recovered? Okay, the, the, the bodies were recovered and brought to Halifax from the Atlantic Ocean via several different ships. One was the Mackie Bennett cable ship, one was the cable ship Minia. The Momonier also brought back bodies. The, the SS Algerine from Newfoundland recovered one body in June, brought the body back to St. John's. The SS Florizel brought the body to Halifax on June 11th, and he was buried June 12th in Fairview Lawn Cemetery. James McGrady was his name, and he was a first-class saloon steward, and he bobbed about in the water with his life vest on from April till June. 
Oh. And we have Batiste Bernardi. Batiste Bernardi was 21 years old. He was from Roccabruna, Italy. And the Roccabruna, the people of his hometown, are still very, very vested in his history. Had a, had a um, um, brass plate inscribed. There was also a cross left and a, and a flag of Roccabruna, which has since disappeared, and probably with the weather. And uh, they're very, very devoted to him, so they did this in his honor. This is J.F.P. Clark, and J.F.P. Clark was the bass violinist in the band. This is an orchestra member. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. Absolutely. Another unknown. The, the, the unknowns buried here are female except for one. Margaret Price was from Ireland. She boarded Titanic in Queenstown with her five boys. Her body was recovered. Her boys were never found. Oh. So there, that's a very, very sad story. And if you go to Cove, which was called Queenstown, now it's Cove, Ireland. I was there in 2015. And when you mentioned that you know where Margaret Rice's grave is, and that, I've, that you've touched her grave, I said I'm here quite often. They're very, very taken by that. So there's large areas of a museum they have there that's devoted to or dedicated to her and to her boys. You're going to add about how she was identified? I can't. Well, uh, we, well, that, no, that, no, you, you know, go ahead. No, that's a neat story. Yeah, it is a neat story. It was difficult to identify her at first, and they found some medication on her and a little card that went, that went with it, and it was from her doctor. So they were able to identify her based on the medication she had. But she also had, it was either a locket or a um, um, medal, and it was the initials inscribed on that as well. So yeah, wow. it's really, really interesting story about her. One thing we're finding over the last year and a half, particularly, is through the DNA, um, um, ancestry.com, different things like that. People are finding out that they have connections to Titanic um, victims or based survivors, on, based on, yeah. based on, based mm -hmm. on the results. So I've been able to help people out recently with that. So I, okay, again, I'm D. Ryan Meister, and I'm president <laughs> of Titanic Society of Atlantic Canada, and Joel Far. Very good. Yes, is one of our newest members actually, and he so kindly is here helping us out tonight. One of our committee members to do the maintenance on the Mount Olivet Cemetery Titanic gravesite. <laughs> and over here is my husband Neil, Neil and uh, Robert Maltzing. This is Neil uh, Meister, and this is my brother Rob Ryan. And uh, Rob it's all in the family. It's all in the family. <laughs> we were given permission by the Archdiocese to look after the gravesite. Because it's Catholic cemeteries, family members are to look after the graves, but their families aren't here. I want to say I just came here to look at the graves, and I stumbled across this, and they were so kind to explain the grave sites to me and just share this information. I'm so glad I ran into Dee. She explained to me that the yellow posts here are all people from the explosion that we talked about earlier. So let's look at some of those. So here we have Annie, wife of John Redman, and you see the date, December 6th. 1917. So here we have William Adams, Julia Adams, Christina Adams, and William Adams. Joseph Ferris, perhaps, December 6th, 1917. Helen M., wife of Edward Myatt. And here are some indicators without a grave marker. Quite interesting. Thomas Scallion, killed in the explosion, December 6th, 1917. I think it's so interesting how they merely call it the explosion. And it was so big, if you can imagine, 1,900 people. That's an amazing, incredible amount of people to perish in one disaster. Bertram Earl, killed by explosion. And I hope this doesn't seem morbid but we really want to respect people and respect history. And that's one of the reasons that I came here. And right over there, there is the Titanic area. Isn't it wonderful how you meet friendly, helpful people? They're actually gonna show me the other cemetery. So there's Dee and her husband in that car in front of me. So here we are, Fairview Cemetery. And apparently this is the Big Daddy. He told me this one is better known and more people come to it, but I'm glad I went to the first one. I never would have met them. But look at that. That's all new. All new grass put in and it's a new walkway. First one I've ever seen it done. So this walkway was just finished. 121 bodies, 121 you said? 121 victims are buried here. As you can notice, the names are much easier to read. 
Yeah, there's, they, they don't have the wear like the, um, the Mount Olivet Cemetery graves because these are more protected. But are these still original? These are still original. All the same stone. It's Gabbro stone that was quarried in Bocabec, New Brunswick, which is a province that is not far from here. It's part of the Maritime Provinces. The first stone ever is Luigi Gatti, and he was the manager of the first class a la carte restaurant, and four of his staff are buried at Mount Olivet. It's 121 graves in three rows. And what is this big one? This big one, this, there's a few big ones, and these were paid for separately, by either by family or they were erected by Bruce Sisme. And they were to be either staff or someone of note that, uh, that um, And that says he died on duty. Alma Paulson, who lost her children, it was believed first that the unknown child right here was her child, so they were very close in functional proximity. But the unknown child is actually Sidney Leslie Goodwin, and he was identified in 2008 by a DNA. This was unknown, and that is what the grave marker said until, until later. Until Sidney was identified, and the family decided to have a separate marker because the, they wanted the marker for the unknown child to represent all the children who were, who were lost, which was a wonderful thing. The interesting thing is, there is a grave marker, not Mr. Pace here, but the one down from there. He is um, Stephen Campbell, and he was one of the crew members on the Mackey Bennett who helped to recover Sydney. And on the other side of the graveyard, there's another gentleman who also was involved with the recovery, and they are buried almost facing little Sydney. Isn't that wonderful? It's amazing. The architect actually designed this to be in the shape of a ship with the opening part down here being where the, 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 the description of where the, um, the boat was, where the boat hit the iceberg on the starboard side. But it's a very interesting shape that was intentional. There's 43 unidentified in Halifax and as you can see you start to see identified more recently in the 90s. So they simply gave them numbers? They, as each body was recovered, the body was given a number and all of their effects were kept together in bags. It was a very, very interesting, very good um, cataloging system that was used. And that same system was used for the Halifax explosion victims. That was a lot of tragedy within a five-year period. Absolutely, absolutely. There are three huge tragedies to befall the Halifax area. In, on April 1st, 1873, the SS Atlantic sank off of Prospect Bay, which is about 35 minutes from here. The recovery of Titanic took place 1912 from April to June. On December 6th, 1917, uh, the Halifax explosion sadly occurred. The SS Emo collided with the Mont Blanc. The SS Emo, Titanic, and Atlantic were all white starships. We really? have a White Star tragedy history. Well, it's about 8.30, and I'm losing my light, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to find my way back to my hotel. But I hope you enjoyed our visit, remembering people who died in two terrible and incredibly historic disasters. Thanks for joining me, everybody. From Halifax, Nova Scotia, I'm Mark with the Average Me Channel. Uh, yeah, with the graveyard like this, awesome. We'll do that, and then we'll try to do one with a... It's harder to snap with this I one. know, right?